thank you very much uh, for tuning in this evening. Uh, this is the second talk we've given now. Um, I did one the other week on the wider archaeology of the park, and now we're doing one specifically on Randall Manor. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, I've just put this illustration up to, to start us off um, to show the manor as it may have looked in around 1300. For those of you that don't know, Randall Manor um, uh, is located in the centre of Shorewoods Country Park. Uh, Shorewoods Country Park is one of uh, KCC's largest country parks. And I spoke about the wider archaeology of the park um, a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, you've got the A2 here for those of you that might not know the park. Uh, the visitor centre and then Randall Manor uh, sits to the north of the visitor centre. It uh, sits on a heritage trail so you can actually take a trail leaflet from the visitor centre and walk down to the manor site and we're keeping it um, open as a, a platform uh, within the wider country park um, uh, cleared of trees so that it will actually um, uh, as an open glade both for nature, wildlife and for the archaeology. Um, we're not the first people to dig at Randall Manor and I think before we sort of look at the work we carried out there between 20, uh, 2006 and uh, 2015 we must pay tribute to George Dockrell who is in the centre here who is a local teacher who is the first person to rediscover the site in the 1960s and dig on the site. Uh, the reason we think he was able to discover it is if you look at this aerial photograph from 1961 you can see that the area where Randall Manor is up here has been coppiced of trees. And it's clear that George and his students were standing in a clearing. So fortuitously in the early 1960s, this area had been coppiced and George was able to then get access to the site and to start work on the site. Um, we know that he, uh, we now know that he uh, focused on the area that was the kitchen um, and he dug a series of trenches around the kitchen um, you can see one of his students here sitting in one of the trenches and then Lynn Palmer who started all the excavations at Randall Manor again in, 20, in 2006 in the same place uh, there as well. So we were able to find their trenches very easily again and you can see how well relatively the archaeology has survived between the two shots almost uh, over 40 years apart. Uh, we also have George's notebooks um, where he described the archaeology that he was finding uh, and you can see the plans here and the trenches and they were very helpful in the early years of the dig to work out exactly what was going on. But to take a step back having acknowledged um, George Dockwell's work, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history first. Um, our main resident of the manor was Sir Henry de Cobham who died in 1316 and his tomb uh, it can still be visited in Sean Church. So once churches are open again uh, after this current lockdown, if you're interested, you can go and visit his church, uh, his church, his, his tomb in uh, Sean Church in what's known as the Randall Chapel. Um, it's, it's been heavily restored in the Victorian period, as you can see, um, but the effigy um, on the top there is, is original. Um, and it, you can see him lying on his, his helm here, his helmet, uh, with a shield and sword uh, and uh, uh, an animal at the base there, uh, uh, a dog, I think it's the dog figure at the base there. Um, we've looked at this quite closely when we've uh, visited the church at, at Sean and there's still some traces of uh, colour on this effigy. So it'd be quite nice to do further work on that at some point to actually see what the colours would have been, how, how visual it would have been originally. So Sir Henry is our main resident and he died in 1316 and his residence was Randall Manor. Um, after him, his son Stephen, who died in 1333, his main residence was probably Allington Castle, but he did have private chapels at Rundell and Allington, and he was clearly still uh, spending some time at Randall Manor as well. Um, we also know from Stephen's um, Inquisition post mortem that he had a windmill on the estate, uh, and this uh, windmill is the site that we spoke about last time the mound up on the heath um, to the west of Randall Manor. Um, and this uh, was a, a post mill, as you can see in the illustration here. So uh, we have two sort of key occupiers of the site, um, Henry and then Stephen. Uh, but it's important to remember as well that um, neither were actually, although they they um, were renting the site, they were actually sort of subtenants. Obviously, the, the the royal family owned all the land at this time. Um, there was a tenant in chief who who, who varied through time. Um, 
At one time, it was uh, uh, one of um, the king's uh, main loyal knights, William de Quatremere, and later it was the sort of the nuns of Fontrevo as well. So uh, the the Cobham family are sub tenants, uh, and they are sort of renting from two layers indirectly from the king. Um, I'm probably making a complete mismatch of this history, so I'm hoping it's making some sense. But uh, Roger, who is hopefully on the chat as well today, this evening, has done a lot of work on the history, and it's really uh, worthy of a whole talk of its own, just the historical side of the of the site. Um, but through Roger's uh, hard work over many years, we have a much better understanding of the site's history now. Um, some other key uh, dates before we move on to the archaeology. We know that uh, there were still signing deeds at Randall Manor in 1362, so it was still a site um, with buildings being used and deeds being signed. So it's still an important site in the 1360s. But by the 1420s, the last of the Cobham line, of uh, Cobham of Randall line, uh, uh, Sir Thomas, uh, he dies. So he is the last Cobham of Randall. Um, very excitingly, although it, <laughs> the, you have to take my word for this, but very excitingly, in 1555, we do have a reference to the actual house itself lying in the parish of Sean next to Randall Pond. And for those of you that took part in the excavations, we spent a long time agonizing over whether we were actually digging Randall Manor. Was it some sort of other site, some sort of high status site we had no records for? And it wasn't until I think 2014 that uh, Roger found this account, um, this reference, this 1555 reference, that actually cites uh, the Manor of Randall next to the Round Pond uh, and actually locates it directly where we were digging. So after nine years of excavations, we were actually finally able to say we were definitely digging on Randall Manor, which is a, a huge relief at this time. Um, we know that in 1558, there was still a building on the site. Uh, there's a reference to the Manor of Randall uh, with a house and appurtenances. Um, but that is the last reference we have to an actual building on the site. And we also know that by 1583, um, the area was being um, planted for coppice woodland. So it could be that, well, it, it, the, the reality is that post-1558 and before 1583, the site is pulled down. Uh, these dates obviously tie up very nicely with when Cobham Hall is being built. So Cobham Hall, or rebuilt rather, Cobham Hall is another medieval manor, um, the sort of the senior manor to, Ran senior manor to Randall Manor. Um, and we know that uh, Cobham Hall was being rebuilt as an, as an Elizabethan mansion in the 1580s. So the dates here tie very nicely with the last date we have for a building standing and the first date we have for a coppice being planted um, in Randall Wood, as it's then called. Uh, we also have one final date, which is 1631. And at this point, the site is referred to as ruinous. Um, so we have a good date range there um, from the sort of the Cobham family taking on the site in the 1300s through to the site being ruinous in the 1600s. Um, I'm not going to enlarge on this today because we're still doing research on it, but we think the site may now date back to the late 1100s at least, um, with some work that Roger's doing at the moment suggesting that it could have started life as a fish farm. And that this round pond, referred to here, Randall Pond, uh, may have started life as a sort of a, a fish farm being run by uh, Fontrevo Abbey, uh, supplying freshwater fish, perhaps to London. Um, so we're still doing some further research on this, but this is quite interesting because it, it could add a whole earlier phase to the site. We do know there's earlier pottery from the site. I mean, there's coinage as well that dates to the 12th century as well. But the so the historical references now suggest we're looking at some sort of fish farm in the late 1100s and that's why Randall Manor is there and that's why um, the site is then chosen later to be Henry de Cobham's uh, uh, manor house. So the fish farm would have had buildings as well but we haven't got any clear evidence of those as yet. The earliest buildings we have clear evidence for are Henry's buildings probably built in the sort of latter half of the 1200s. Um, moving on, obviously, as we progress the site, we've been able to amass further maps and details for the site, information for the site. We do have some early maps. I mean, this is, it's uh, very schematic, but we have a 1596 map, this Simonson map, which obviously shows Cobham Hall and, and uh, having been built by that point, 
but nothing in between Cobham and Sean. So obviously there's no reference to anything still standing at Randall, which obviously ties in very nicely with our um, historical information. Uh, we have a 1769 map. This is Andrew, Drury and Herbert uh, showing Sean Woods in detail, probably for the, I think the first time we have a sort of a, a drawing showing the woodland. And again, no reference to any ruins. So by this point, uh, a couple of hundred years, probably after it's pulled down, uh, the site is, is completely wooded over. And at this point, the, the site is also known as Shornwood. Um, there is some interchanging between whether it's known as Shorn or Cobham Woods, depending on how, how big a boundary the uh, Watling Street is seen uh, to the people describing it. But by 1760s, obviously, there's no, uh, there's no uh, reference to a building there. Um, and then this map, which I've shown uh, many times, the 1797 map, which starts to show other buildings in the in the wider landscape, Randall Hall that we spoke about last time, the post medieval buildings there. Um, they have replaced, they have taken on the name of Randall because Randall Manor is actually further to the east in this area here. And that's now missing. So we have Sean Woods again, but we have nothing up here in Randall at all, being marked on the map at least. What we do obviously have in addition to the historic mapping is the LIDAR. Uh, and now obviously LIDAR we've spoken about before is this amazing laser survey and this survey um, is uh, a fantastic way of looking at the wider landscape. We didn't have the LIDAR until uh, 2011 but the LIDAR has enabled us to sort of look at the lumps and bumps in the in landscape around Randall Manor as well. So hopefully you can see in the centre there where my uh, mouse pointer is you can see uh, the Randall Manor platform you can also make out some of the buildings at that point because they're all exposed still. Um, you've got the round pond here, which could be our earlier fish pond. Uh, you've got a middle pond here and you've got a lower pond. Um, so these could be all part of the same pond network. And some of them, at least the round pond, may predate the manor site itself, this platform. Uh, in the wider landscape, you've also got a large field boundary up here to the north, uh, which is clearly enclosing an area of, of land. Um, you've got another field boundary to the uh, to the east. You've got the clay works, and you can see how close the clay works came to damaging Randall Manor. And then just to the west of the platform at Randall, you've got this Holloway here. And this Holloway um, would have probably been the original Holloway down trackway down to the site, and it's branching off from this much more significant Holloway here, which is running north south. So this one is still very visible in the landscape and you can walk along it and it becomes a nice hollow way as it approaches the Sean Ifield Road to the north here. But there's a much more subtle one here running east-west. And this one, we've never investigated it further. Roger discovered this before we had the LIDAR and it was confirmed by the LIDAR. And this is probably the original trackway running down to the manor site. And it would be great to investigate that later. Um, you can see a bit more detail when we zoom in here. Um, here's this trackway again leading down to the manor. Here's the manor platform. Uh, here's the round pond just to the, to the northwest of the main platform. Uh, and there is the, the middle pond directly north of the platform itself. Um, there are other features on here. Ignore some of this on this side because the clay works has started to erode away this side of the platform. But it could be that there was another Holloway coming into the corner of the site here. And at one point we were wondering whether this um, corner here um, is actually where they started to um, remove stone from the site and ship it up towards the Holloway to take it perhaps to Cobham Hall as part of the building of Cobham Hall. Um, because a lot of the demolition is very evident in this corner of the site. So it could be that there's a later access route into the site from this uh, south uh, west corner and the other lidar obviously the beauty of lidar is that you can light the results from different directions and you can see different things on this one um, you can see very clearly again that the, the, the trackway going down to the site the platform itself the flattened platform and the fish ponds around it so before we come to the archaeology i think one other thing to remember is that Although we always approach Randall Manor from the south uh, and from the visitor centre and the car park, it may be that in addition to having access to Randall Manor, as we discussed from the LIDAR from the Holloway, you would have accessed 
um, the landscape from the north as well. So this is a view that Roger actually took, Roger Cockett Roger, um, from uh, north uh, north of, uh, of Sean Woods, you can see Sean Woods on the horizon here, um, looking towards the gap in the uh, in the woodland here where Randall Manor would have sat. So this would have also been a way of approaching the manor from the north and obviously the the view, key views, the principal views of the manor also looked north. So although we always approach the site from the south it's always useful to perhaps look at the site from a different direction and think about the land that uh, Randall Manor sat within and the fact that a lot of access would have been from the from the north as well. So it's just interesting to sort of reverse the way we look at the site and come at it from a northerly direction. Um, also to remember that Randall Manor was one of a whole series of manors that sat within a medieval landscape. So we had this painting painted for the Cobham Landscapes project and you can see here Randall Manor with its ponds uh, in this or the bottom right corner of the uh, of the uh, image. Uh, Watling Street here in the middle, uh, Cobham Manor as was here um, in this or middle left of the image and then further south you've got um, this, this sort of the streets here and the the other access the other access east-west access across the landscape with Cobham Village here, um, North Court, um, Vions uh, and Jeskins, a whole series of uh, other manors in the wider landscape. So so you have this whole series of wider manners in, in the wider landscape. So you have to sort of remember that uh, Randall was one of several medieval manors in a, in a sort of interconnected landscape. I hope that history side of things made sense. I, I'm happy to do another talk perhaps about the wider history at another moment, but we'll move on to the um, archaeology now. So bearing in mind all of that information that we've amassed, some of it during the project, some of it before the project started, um, this is the view that we faced in 2006 uh, when you approach Randall Manor from the west. Uh, and as you can see from this image, it was very hard to see where uh, there was any evidence for a manor site um, in this landscape. So the first thing we did was to cut all the trees down on the platform uh, to open up the landscape. Um, and subsequently, we also stump grinded them and removed all the stumps as well. Um, and that gave us a much clearer picture of what we were looking at. Uh, we undertook some geophysics. Um, uh, this wasn't uh, uh, the ever reliable John Townsend. This was some, uh, uh, another survey. I think Roger actually did this survey for us, Roger Cockett, Roger. Um, and you can see here from the geophysics that there are areas here um, where there are areas of sort of high resistance which uh, suggest walls. So the black is low resistance, the white is high resistance, and you can see here lots of evidence of possible walls. Um, and as you'll see, as we look at the next few images of the actual dig site, this, this was a very uh, good survey, and gave us a good indication of where we could suggest archeology span was. Um, at some times, at some points in the geophysics, it perhaps was picking up um, areas of hard clay associated with banks rather than walls, but it was very good at still determining where the key walls were. So uh, this is um, the sort of a schematic plan showing what we discovered. Um, and I will show photographs of each of these areas as we move forwards. But you can see here, um, we had uh, an old hall, um, which was our sort of our first main building. This is the building we're sort of associating with Sir Henry de Cobham, the, 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 the Lord who died in 1316 and was and buried in Sean Church. So you've got the, the large old hall, you've got a two story uh, stone cross wing added to the end of this old hall. Um, and then you've got a further service wing added to the north of that. So you've got three sort of three principal buildings here. Um, we think that the two-story stone building is an addition, and well, we know it's an addition, and we're sort of tentatively associating that with Stephen and sort of improving the site in sort of the, sort of the early 1300s after he inherits the site from his father and before he sort of moves to Allington full-time perhaps um, with this service wing as well. So you have sort of two main phases here, Old Hall uh, with additional buildings added onto the Old Hall and the kitchen building here, which is the other building we ex explored in a lot of detail, again looks like it has two main phases. Um, an earlier phase, perhaps a timber phase, replaced with a sort of a, 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 a grander stone phase. 
um, and that sort of reflects the this sort of the timber old hall replaced with this stone building here. So you've definitely got at least two main phases of building going on. Uh, this is the main building and I think Pauline's in the conversation this evening. So you can see Pauline standing here looking north across the main building, our, our old hall. And just to the right of Pauline there is an area that we sort of uh, were, uh, decided and, and through sort of careful excavation was what was left of the central hearth of the old hall. So the, the old hall as it in its sort of first original um, uh, version had a central tiled or, or, or uh, baked uh, hearth, central hearth here. Um, the building would have had low stone walls and a huge timber roof and looked a bit like a barn, um, but with sort of central aisle posts as well. Uh, so uh, you've got a, that's our first building. This is looking at it from the other direction uh, and you can see again the sort of the walls, the sort of low stone walls of the old hall. A uh, possible couple of features here which uh, probably associated with uh, the entrance to the old hall. Uh, one of them could even be some sort of stairwell perhaps. We're not quite certain about that because we only had the footings left. Um, but this, so you can see the sort of the main building behind and also all the tile scatters. Anyone who came to Randall Manor will remember, of course, um, how many tile scatters we had to dig through to get to the buildings. Um, so you've got the old hall and then you've got added to the front of the old hall, the stone cross wing. Now, this was a, a, a substantial addition to the old hall, very much thicker walls than the old hall had. Um, you can see John French standing in the middle of it there. Um, this was a building that Gerald very carefully excavated over a number of seasons. Uh, it had a sort of central partition to it. Um, there was some evidence for um, steps leading up into the old hall. Um, and this, with the, the, the very substantial footings, we think was a, probably a two-storey building. It had very um, substantial chalk uh, foundations to it as well. So it was definitely some, a load-bearing wall that could have been built to two storeys. Uh, just to give you an example of a building, a two-storey stone building nearby, you have Temple Manor at Strood. So although it's a slightly different structure, you could get an idea of the sort of the size of building we're looking at. The two-storey stone building, very impressive um, to look at, very impressive to, to visit. Um, and th this is the sort of um, the site you would have seen if you'd visited the manor uh, in the sort of uh, early, well, sort of early 1300s. At the end of the service wing, so this additional wing that was built onto the stone uh, building we were just talking about, you have our guard robe. So obviously, again, a guard robe is a very high status uh, structure. Um, this one had a sloped floor to it, but no evidence for a drain out the front of the guard robe. So presumably, this would have been cleaned out at regular intervals by someone small enough to squeeze into this spot. Uh, probably a, a, a young adult or, or a, a small child would have had to crawl in there to scrape out the the, um, the cess uh, and we think it would have been a first floor toilet so um, again we're looking at a two-story building here with the toilet on the first floor dropping in down this chute into uh, this area here. So this is uh, a reconstruction drawing that Roger uh, did for us in 2011 I think it was and you can see here the, the old hall with its low stone walls and huge um, timber and tiled roof. Um, this is reflected by all the little tile scatters we had around the building. You've got the stone cross wing here, um, sort of two stories, very impressive, with a possible porch to one side. Uh, the additional service wing running off to the north with a guard rope in the corner, and then our kitchen here. Um, in addition, when they add the stone cross wing, we think at this point they also add a very substantial chimney to the back of the old hall. So the, the central hearth I was speaking about earlier is replaced by this uh, sort of stone chimney at the back of the old hall. And we have a few pieces of this, of this chimney. It would have been um, hexagonal in shape, very sort of su substantial construction. And you can see here the ranging pole there. And um, this is a really high status addition to the building and shows that they were still um, uh, upgrading the building uh, when they added the stone cross wing. So this is a very high status addition, this, uh, this stone chimney. And we have a few pieces, a few fragments of it that were sort of dumped as the, the presumably the site was being demolished and stone robbed in this or later 1500s. 
We also uh, had your University of Leicester students um, look at doing some 3D models of the manor. And I, I found this again today when I was uh, putting the talk together. And this gives you another, sort of another view, uh, aisle hall at the back, stone cross wing, porch area here, and then the additional service wing here with the internal uh, toilet block. Uh, moving on to the kitchen, the kitchen sat detached from the main buildings, uh, probably to sort of uh, prevent, uh, sort of, uh, if a fire broke out in the kitchen, it's spreading to the main buildings. So it sat away to sort of the northwest of the uh, the main buildings. And as I said earlier, it has at least two phases. Uh, and you can see two phases here with this tiled hearth we had replaced by a stone flag, flagstone hearth above it. Um, uh, and you can see it again in this image here very clearly. Um, the later building were, had stone, uh, stone walls. The earlier building we think was probably mostly timber again uh, with, the, with the central tiled hearth here. So we're again seeing this very clear evidence for two phases of uh, construction going on. Uh, this is a nice illustration that Alan Marshall, the, uh, the local artist, uh, has done for us, showing the interior of the kitchen. And you can see here the, the hearth being used. Um, we had some sort of um, uh, structure running through the middle of the building that the hearth sat in front of. Uh, and then behind a whole series of possible storage structures that we're still trying to sort of uh, understand exactly what they were for. Some of them were chalk lined. This just gives you an idea of this sort of the, uh, the kitchen in full flow in this sort of uh, early 1300s. Um, away from these structures, so away from the sort of the western side of the site where all of our main buildings were, you've got this structure which was a, a, a brew house. And this is a building that Gerald and Jill worked on and Sophie worked on over a number of seasons again. Um, we weren't sure what it was at first. Um, also in the corner here, sitting underneath it, was a very substantial stone uh, footing, almost keeping back the corner of the platform, which we still don't quite understand why that was there. It's some sort of base for an earlier structure. But sitting on top of that was this brew house, which was a, a sort of a circular feature with a tile top to it, and on this tile um, top would have sat um, a, so a copper kettle for brewing water um, as part of the brew, brew house process. Uh, you can see here the, the, uh, the flue here. This was the flue where they would have heated the copper kettle above. Um, and you can also see in this image um, the sort of re amount of reused stone that was, was put into this building. So this may have been part of one of the later phases of the manor site. Obviously, having your own brew house was quite prestigious again. Uh, the ability to still brew a light beer on the site um, would have put it as a sort of a, a higher status structure. Um, we found part of a carved stone cross reused in the uh, in the brew house wall here. And I, hopefully the next one, oh, I haven't got it there. The, it, we found another part of this, the uh, this stone cross later. I'll come back to that. Uh, and we think it was part of a, a sort of a, a grave slab. So. We're not quite sure where this has come from, but this has been recycled into the building again. Uh, this is the manor in 2013. So you can see uh, very clearly here the square kitchen building and then to the, uh, although it's orientated to, to the left, to the south is the, uh, the main aisled hall. And at the back, you can just make out here the uh, chimney structure. Uh, 2014, you can again, you can see very clearly the stone uh, kitchen building here, the end of the uh, service wing with the guard robe in over to the right here. Um, and just here, you can just make out one of the earlier phases of the kitchen again. In 2015, our last sort of uh, dig on the site, we looked at the sort of southern edge of the site and we discovered a, a whole host of further buildings here. Uh, not built as substantially as the buildings to the west or to the sort of the northeast where the brew house was. These buildings here perhaps relate to the later phases of the site. So after the Cobhams uh, stopped living on the site in the later 1300s, um, the site is uh, tenanted out to, uh, to, to, lo to, to local families. And it could be that these buildings here relate to the sort of the tenancy period of the site where the site is still being occupied through to the 1500s, but the main buildings are probably falling into disrepair. Uh, the site is probably a farm by this point, and these buildings probably relate to those phases. 
this is the picture that I was uh, talking about earlier. This is the, the, the grave slab we've had for the site. So this is a, a cross pate here, um, a sort of a, a very um, uh, a, a medieval symbol here that you see on, on other structures, known as the cross pate, uh, but it forms part of a grave slab. So this has come perhaps from some sort of religious context and how it ended up at the manor broken up and reused in the buildings we don't know. Um, it's one of the sort of mysteries of the site, which we need to do further research on. Uh, as I discussed in my the previous talk about Sean Woods, we have had two complete floor tiles from the site. Uh, one is a geometric pattern, and James Elford, a local artist, uh, painted uh, the, the wider pattern so you can see how it would have um, meshed into a, a floor of those tiles. And we also had this here, which is a, a tile showing the top half of a lady. Uh, with a brooch. Now at one point we wondered if this was actually um, one of the Cobham family who uh, lived on the site but we found uh, identical tile from a site in Hastings. So this is a, a medieval floor tile design uh, which has appeared at Randall Manor. Now neither of these tiles shows any evidence for being mortared on the back. They're completely clean so we don't quite know how the tiles came to the well how the tiles were used on the site. Are they the sort of the equivalent of the kitchen tile sample that you see today? Um, that's probably a bit sort of frivolous, but it, it's, it's very odd that neither of them has been mortared at all. So however they were used on the site, however they were fixed into a structure on the site, they left no trace on the back of them. So we need to, again, some further research on these to understand what these mean for this or wider understanding of the site. We had this very nice lead pewter flask. Um, which uh, is a, a very large example, we think possibly of a pilgrim's flask. Um, really the sort of size and shape of a costrel, which is a sort of a medieval water flask, but they're very unusual uh, in lead. And there's no parallel, parallel example of this flask that we know of. Um, it's, it could be a very large pilgrim's flask. In the center, you can just make out here a white line and, it, and there's another white line going across. So it does make the shape of a cross. So, are we perhaps looking at some sort of religious object that was buried under the foundations of the building, um, perhaps to as part of the sort of the, the ceremony, uh, part of the well, or part of the the ritual, if you like, of the construction of the building? Um, we again need to do further research on this uh, find as well, and we've had it conserved by Dana Goodburn Brown, um, but without a parallel to to look to, we're looking at a very unusual object here and a very high status object made of lead. We also have this uh, not very interesting piece of Islamic glass uh, and again we've uh, spoken about this before but this is again a very high status uh, object. Um, you can just about make out some Arabic writing on this piece of glass which says the learned one or the conqueror in, in Arabic script. Um, uh, it would have been gilded originally so a very high status object as I keep saying. Um, Here's an example of a complete glass, go glass goblet of a similar um, design and shape. Um, so the fact that we have um, Islamic glass on the site, the fact that we have lead pewter flasks, suggests that this is a site that obviously um, attracted wealth. And we know that the Cobham family were sheriffs of Kent. Um, so they were significant land, um, significant um, members of this or the, uh, the ruling elite of the time and could clearly afford to have high status objects on the site. The glass was found on a midden at the end of the uh, service wing, just beyond where the toilet was, uh, just outside the main wall of the building here where the, the toilet sat. So as rubbish was being accumulated on the site, this glass uh, goblet was broken and then um, dropped into the midden here. But we only have one piece of it, so the rest of it is missing uh, and it's always been an <laughs> sort of a desire to sort of work out where the rest of this object is. Presumably it's in some uh, rubbish pit that sits off site that we haven't discovered yet. Uh, we also had a, star, a, a, a carved stone head. Uh, this is a, um, a label stop which would have sat uh, on one side of an arch doorway. Um, now this was found on the spoil heap as all good finds are as we were sort of uh, backfilling the site. Um, it could be a piece of reused stone. Again, it could have just been used within the walls of the buildings as the cross pate, the carved stone, uh, gravestone marker was. But it, 
it could also be uh, part of a decoration for the main building sitting to one side of an arched doorway that you would have looked at as you crossed the threshold. Uh, so it's very tantalizing again. Um, you know, we, we don't know who this person was. Are they a member of the Cobham family? The hair looks similar to the hair on the um, tile that we had. Um, so it's of the right period, but we know uh, we don't know anything more about it. So it's, a, it's another sort of glimpse into the decoration potentially of the main building. So the site obviously, in addition to being a sort of an excavation that um, adult volunteers took part in, uh, every year we had uh, child, um, we had child labour, we had, we had schools involved in the site every year. Um, it was a big part of the dig over the 10 years was to have schools involved and to me it was one of the most important parts. Obviously it was great to learn so much about Randall Manor but it was just as important to have kids involved and you can actually see here I've just noticed Albert there standing looking at the kids as they're working with Trevor here. Um, uh, we had a whole load of local schools involved and it was really a highlight of each year was having the kids uh, uh, on the dig. We also ran a whole series of guided tours and you can see here various, uh, we had the local MP come down, we had the Mayor of Gravesend come down, I think he thought he was opening something, he looked a bit confused but he had a good tour. Um, so every year we made sure that um, anyone who came to the site got a tour around, either from, uh, from me or from Dennis who many of you will know. Um, so it was a big part of the sort of the whole site was to do tours, was to have the kids involved as well as doing the archaeology. They're all equally important. And I must pay credit to all of the volunteers who took part over the 10 years of the dig. You can see some of them here in the various uh, photos. We had a different t-shirt every year uh, and we made sure we took a, a, a team photo every year. And you can see a, a whole host of the volunteers here and how stylish they all looked in their t-shirts. Um, but they made the dig the success it was. I mean, it, we couldn't have uh, sort of taken part in the dig year after year without the volunteer um, uh, input into the project. So they are the reason the dig was so successful. And they're the reason I'm still sort of driving myself on to get the, the whole site written up, which is a, a whole another project in itself. Uh, but you have to do that. You know, you can't excavate these sites and not have a commitment to um, writing up the sites afterwards. And at this point, obviously it would be, um, I should pay tribute to Albert again and Albert Daniels who was very good at writing up his sites and is an example to us all. So uh, he saw his, his, his sort of, uh, his example is spurring me on to make sure we do get the site written up over the next few years. So you can see here we have, uh, uh, we have our website, Shulman's Archaeology, where we put updates on regularly about the sort of work we're doing in the park. Uh, we obviously have the Facebook page, Archaeology in Kent. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter or you can email me if you have any questions. And I will conclude uh, with this image. Uh, again, James Elford, the, the local artist and volunteer for many years on the dig and our, one of our fine specialists. Uh, this is an image of Randall Manor in about 1300. Uh, you can see the main uh, north-south Holloway here I spoke about on the, uh, looking at on the LIDAR. And then the track, Rogers track going down to the site here and our large fish pond. Uh, which could be part of this sort of earlier fish farm set up on the site before the manor is built. And also, obviously, to remember, again, that the manor itself, the views you would have had from the upper floor of the stone cross wing would have allowed you to see down towards the Thames. Uh, nestled in this valley with a clay hill here, which has gone now to, to clay extraction, uh, but looking sort of north and north east down towards the Thames. So I will stop there, having almost lost my voice. Uh, and hand over to Sophie for any questions. And thank you, thank you again for uh, taking part and sort of uh, showing an interest. And we will run one further talk in December on the Common Landscapes project, which will sort of uh, uh, wrap up the project we've been taking part in over the last uh, three or four years. So thank you very much. <laughs>